please welcome Biden and Richard to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, the mic working? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so first of all, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Bidhan. I'm the founder of Bagel. Um, Bagel is a decentralized AI project. In my previous life, I used to be the AI ML infra lead for Amazon Alexa, and now bringing those experience here. And my guest today is Richard. I'll let him introduce himself really quickly. Great to be here. Thank you for inviting. Um, yeah, so my name is Richard Muirhead. I'm a managing partner at Fabric Ventures. Uh, indeed, you can find us at fabric.vc. Um, so um, my uh, background was as an engineer and then building a couple of different software companies, but I've been investing in and around this space for uh, since 2012-13 now. Um, and uh, I wasn't part of the engineering team at Alexa, um, but um, some of that technology came from, from Cambridge where I uh, read my engineering degree. Um, and actually, one of my favorite stories is about a, a professor who didn't build that technology, but he has sold three different speech recognition companies uh, whilst being an academic. He's a professor, Steve Young. He sold one to Microsoft, one to Google, and then one to Apple, which I think is a pretty good hat trick. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain he doesn't need to work any, anymore. Um, but yeah, it's great tech that came out of uh, Cambridge for speech recognition. Um, yeah, great to hear. Um, great to hear your experience and your knowledge in the AI space as well. And recently you've been really active in the intersection of Web3 and AI. Um, so we'd love to know your thoughts around that. Like what kind of ideas do you think that are being developed nowadays are really promising? for the future of AI? So, um, yeah, you're right. We recently published something which sort of uh, summarizes in a, in a mere 50 pages um, some of our thoughts um, about what is um, important uh, with this intersection. Um, but a few things on that. One is to try to do something I don't always do, which is get to the point, is that we think the most critical thing is that there is a new uh, business model that is created that can work more effectively in, in the world of open and decentralized AI than the kind of competing model of centralized capitalism works in, should we say, closed AI. Um, and the reason we uh, think that is that although we also believe that uh, openness and decentralization is kind of philosophically the right thing to do uh, because we think it has the highest uh, probability of avoiding some type of dystopia, whether that's kind of corporate driven or, or you know, even nation state uh, or global state driven. Um, and even though we think that technically um, an open and decentralized approach, that's, you know, those are the origins of many of the great innovations in, in the AI space and indeed, of course, the Web3 uh, space. And that we think that that technical architecture can, uh, and maybe we'll come to it, can be, should be superior. Um, it can actually get more of the right data at the right time in the right format to the right place, you know, in order to drive AI. Um, neither of those things, they're, they're kind of great, but they're not sufficient to fight the forces of centralization that exist from the kind of digitally turbocharged capitalism that we, we kind of both benefit from and are subjugated by today. And so <clears throat> we need to make token economics work. Uh, and we need to make it work at multiple different levels, uh, which we'll come to, uh, I'm sure. So that's the kind of recent thinking uh, that we, we've been doing. Um, and that was a briefer summary than I think of 50 pages, but it sort of unpacks it a, a little bit more. Um, but yeah, no, and I think it's, um, it's become, of course, suddenly extremely uh, sort of topical and popular to talk about this intersection, uh, and for good reason. Uh, and we could get into a discussion like, you know, have we reached the end days of, of, of AI or actually is there more to come? And, 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 and I think, I mean, the kind of there's much more to come in terms of technical innovation. But maybe again, we can come to that in a second. Um, 
and it has become more topical, but actually from a fabric perspective, uh, it's been core to our view of the world, let's call it that, um, effectively since the beginning. Um, we all, a bunch of us who were kind of were engineers and, and builders, you know, uh, by background, uh, had been uh, studying or playing around with machine learning primitives from back in the day. Um, uh, our erstwhile venture partner, uh, Stephen Waterhouse, was working with Steve Young and in the speech recognition department, engineering department, back back in the 90s, and um, and we we always saw there was this critical interplay between Web3 and AI that um, we saw the mission effectively of Web3 was to organize the world's data and organize the world's data in a way that it can be consumed and interplay with algorithms, you know, i.e. sort of AI. Um, and so it's always been kind of a, about that. And in that context, something I know you're very hot on, uh, privacy preservation is clearly, you know, critical. Uh, you're... I don't think there's a single person who'd want all of their data to be made available to everybody in the world in what is not just a kind of increasingly sort of searchable world, but in one where, of course, AI can uh, compress, you know, search, compress, and synthesize and create an inference and an action uh, from some piece of data that you have unwittingly shared with the world. So privacy preservation is, is pretty critical. And that was one of our kind of early <clears throat> eurekas or one of the epiphanies on our road back, it was actually as a panel I was talking on in, uh, I want to say 2017 actually, uh, that that interplay was going to be very crucial. Uh, yeah, like couldn't agree more. Um, like uh, two takeaways, like uh, we, I also, like we personally also believe at Bagel that openness is where it's at, like where AI should be. Like historically, if you look at the history of the tech industry, um, open systems have always won over kind of the closed systems, right? You, th you think about like uh, Linux, which runs like 96% of the world's cloud. It's an open system, and the whole community is working together to develop. It won out. Uh, Python is also the same open system, the whole language, MySQL, all of those things. AI will inevitably go there but it's not there yet. So we are in the early stages. And, but how can we take AI to go there where it's open at the same time it benefits the contributors and Web3 gives us that superpower to be able to do so. We don't say like open from a perspective like socialist perspective, like hey, everything has to be open, everyone should have access to all the resources. We talk about like open in terms of monetizable way. You can have an open system where the participants are able to monetize it. And how can you monetize it if you don't have privacy? Like without privacy, there's the monetization. They go hand in hand. So we also ended up in that uh, kind of area where, you know what, we have to figure out like how we can do privacy preserving AI. Otherwise, there's not gonna be any monetization. And if there's no monetization, there's like no community incentives for contribution. And we are not going to go to that stage where all of these technologies scaled to planet scale that I just mentioned, like Linux, like Python, or whatever, um, with AI until we get there. So those, that's the basic where we started from. And we are solving it with our privacy preserving machine learning solution and decentralized. We can get into the details of that like technically. But that's why we think it's important. And I feel like we're aligned on that. Totally. Um, so I'm tempted to talk about, um, because, sorry, it, it's, don't worry, it's you're fine. Leave it there, it can't fall, fall any further. Um, but the, um, my pocket's too small. Um, but the, um, I'm tempted to unpack this point about, you know, openness always kind of winning. Because in a sense it does, and in a sense it, it hasn't. And we can come back to this because we had a sort of diagram we created a few years back uh, which spoke of the kind of fourth and golden age of, of open source. Because um, we saw there was kind of a romantic stage uh, when Stallman and others thought this is, this is the way that just the world should operate and then we can contribute and everything should be free. And then there was the stage when 
uh, folks like MySQL, and we have a, one of my kind of partners over the years has been the co-founder of, of MySQL, and they built businesses around that. It turned out that was actually quite difficult to build businesses around open source software. And then the third age was actually where all the open source goodness is kind of, it's, it's perpetuated, but in a slightly cynical way by the closed um, um, cloud operators, effectively, not just the kind of the infrastructure of cloud operators, but the you know anyone who's got a running a, an application service, basically. Um, and so um, that's really um, in the way we looked at it: a situation where Google and IBM and others they're effectively making trillions of dollars of market capitalization off software they don't own. Uh, but they kind of contribute to, and our data <laughs> that they use either for the marketplace or for targeting ads or whatever. So, so I think um, I think part of our mission here is that we want to get to that fourth golden age where you can have you can you can use token economics to reward contributors, contributors of GPU, contributors of well, contributors to the software base for sure, but also contributors of GPU, contributors of data, and that reward c can happen. Um, but, like, in general, something that the whole Web3 space has wrestled with um, is this tension, and kind of uh, Jesse Walden uh, over at, um, at, at um, uh, his uh, variant uh, put it w this way, that, that you can't decentralize too quickly. You have to go for a progressive approach. And he, I think, you know, it's a, it was a generally kind of observable sort of truism. Um, but he kind of wrapped it into that phrase of you know, progressive decentralization. You can't do that because, um, you know, to, not to trivialize it too much, but if, you, if, you, if you're having a sort of a kid's party and you sort of go straight in, you go you know, ask the kids, hey, what should we do? Why don't we all vote on it or whatever? Um, you don't tend to make that many decisions that quickly and arguably not, not very sort of good ones. Um, <clears throat> so there's some merit, especially in the early days of, of building startups and of building networks and communities of, of being able to you know, kind of centralize it. So I think we're still wrestling with how to use token economics and to, to, to deliver on decentralized governance in a way that's effective. But I do um, agree it's sort of valuable. So in, in that context, when you've been playing with um, trying to deliver on privacy preservation and you've been um, you know, delivering your you know, GP restaking capability, what have been the, the sort of thorniest um, technical challenges and what have been the thorniest or most tricky um, economic or you know, business model related challenges? I don't know if you can unpack that f for me, for us. Yeah, uh, definitely. Also, again, like uh, aligned on that as well. Like you cannot have everything, your all business secrets out in the open. Um, that's where the monetizability comes in. Like that's what we can enable with Web3. Like that's why we are here. Like we want to contribute uh, to the open ecosystem. At the same time, we want to be rewarded for that. And that's how we incentivize high quality contributions to begin with. And one of the uh, newest things that we launched in this space is like, as Richard mentioned, GPU restaking. So uh, we launched it with the uh, we launched this uh, in collaboration with the Filecoin Foundation, where we are gonna use all the GPUs from the Filecoin Miner network on our machine learning platform. So developers who are using it would be able to get access to practically infinite compute. And one of the challenges with that is um, like whatever comes with the decentralization, like you are using some hardware somewhere else held by some miner in some other country, and you want to use that for your AI workloads, which means you have, you'll probably use some data that you have which might be private. You don't really want this some random person who you don't know to get access to it fully. So how can you leverage their hardware without giving them access to your data? That's one of the biggest challenges. And it's a, a hard problem that we're solving but that's the North Star we want to go to. Like we want peer-to-peer -peer machine learning. So where are you on that journey of solving that problem? Because obviously there's there's a, a number of approaches to that technically. I mean, it presumably it has to involve um, data going to the compute, given that you can't bring the compute to the data in that case. Yeah, like uh, to break it down like really easily, there are ways you can deliver encrypted data 
to this remote machine somewhere and get results back from them. So they do the operations and total encrypted data, and they send it back, the results. And then you decrypt the result, and you get what you want. That's the best way to do it. Like, there's no... What's the, what's the overhead of that, though? If you've got to do that encryption and decry decryption, does that, does that create... Uh, I mean, does it need compression after that? Is it a high, a high low, lower kind of bandwidth requirements? Does, is there a latency issue that kicks in that's a problem? What are you? Yeah, so in tech, everything is a trade off. And if you are encrypting, that has a higher latency and higher overhead. And that's coming down. Like for us, we are going to the North Star. It's like we want to have decentralized AI. And at the same time, it has to be private. And it's hard to do. So we are not like throwing our hands like, hey, there's like higher latency, higher overhead. We're not going to do it. We're figuring out how to do it more effectively. And like if you want to go to like technical details, like there are actually ways we figure out how to do it as almost as efficiently as possible without encrypting it. Like there are technologies like differential privacy, which you can kind of bind with zero knowledge proofs. You can do fully homomorphic encryption on parts of the data to reduce the overhead by 1,000x and still get the same result, right? So that's where we are. We're actually bringing it down by a lot. But having said that, it, the overhead is still a little bit higher than doing it on the raw data, but that's not an option for a lot of users. For me, like if I want to train my personal model on a GPU someone has somewhere, maybe if you have, I'll be open to like send the data to you. But if I don't know someone, I don't want to send that. So for me, even if it's a little bit higher overhead, that's the only option I have. I don't have any alternative. And, and is it, it's not just kind of like a, um, a sort of unidirectional thing. Um, I guess I'm having in my mind's eye um, uh, a kind of a, a network of data that's being moved around to the computer. I, you're aware of where the computer is available, and you can work out you know, which is closest to the, the data currently. And, and then apply your, you know, homomorphic encryption, differential privacy, you know, ZK proofs, whatever you, you need in order to limit the amount of data that's both um, transmitted and also shared. Um, you, you do you also do, do that and have, like, have a kind of a, a topology of, of the environment and optimize for the, the, the shortest, the, the minimal amount of data movements across that topology? Yeah, um, I love that question. Like, uh, it shows that Richard has like deep knowledge in the AI space. Um, yeah, you can actually enable that. So that's uh, our collaboration with the Filecoin Foundation. We're working with the storage provider. We're going to be working with the storage providers, and all the storage providers are basically data centers. Mm -hmm. And you can do the routing in such a way that whoever provides the lowest latency, they get the better rewards. Mm -hmm. And the whole incentive mechanism, in, uh, how it works, like the result we get is that the Computation happens very close to where the data is. And that's the advantage of working with the Falcon Foundation as well, because all the storage providers and all the infrastructure providers, they provide both the storage and the compute. So the computation happens where the data is. And that reduces the overhead of latency by a lot. Um, uh, Again, like one of the reasons uh, Filecoin Foundation was the uh, best partner for these kind of products to be launched. Mm -hmm. And we have thought about it a lot, and that's how we can enable like, reducing the latency, and you can get almost Web 2-like experience and latency. So it's, in, so it's interesting. So my, uh, well, the first company we built we looked at quality of service and, and sort of VPN topologies and security and whatever in, uh, in the 90s. Uh, in the kind of that first sort of wave of building out the internet, and the, there is a certain traffic pattern that comes when you you're basically um, you know you have a someone that's dialing up at that point in time, and then you're serving a web page, you know, uh, and then, then you have to look at some kind of caching. And I was watching um, Jensen um, Huang, you know, for, obviously from Nvidia, um, <clears throat> him and his leather, yeah. <laughs> him and him, him and his him and his leather jacket. Um, I was watching him uh, on the keynote this year, and uh, what, I mean, there were many fascinating things. Obviously, like uh, the sort of thirty-two thousand GPU Bakewell or whatever it's called data center architecture, and the um, uh, you know the fact that you can heat up a jacuzzi with one of their kind of wiring cabinets if you want wanted to, um, and. 
Um, and also the kind of, it's going from kind of like, obviously CPUs to GPUs to kind of XPUs and this, you know, these, the silicon is going to be everywhere in, in robots and sensors and everything, so it's specialized. Um, so that was fascinating. But, they, but one other thing struck me, maybe with my kind of arcane background in sort of the network topology side, was that there's going to be a, um, a change in the traffic patterns on the internet because, uh, partly directly because of generative AI, because you can have models in this sort of future world, I think, you know, kind of whatever, Elon's on record, but probably a lot of people, they will go to this wor world of kind of billions of models, uh, huge foundational ones, but tiny micro sort of personal ones, and they're kind of located in lots of different places. And each of them can be trained, and each of them can, it can, can infer, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so you have a different, consequently, you have a different pattern of traffic, uh, and especially when you think of them as being trained and inferring, in a multimodal way. So it's, it's not like it's just a bit of text, sort of a small context window and a small amount of text. It's a kind of infinite context window of video. <laughs> the, yeah. the, and so that's going to have fundamental consequences on the kind of network traffic at the very kind of base layer of the internet, like if it, below the web, if you will. Um, and I found that quite interesting because it suggests to me and it obviously is related to the GPU, GPU and the compute question and the storage question, how we're going to cache stuff. But it's like, it's, it's at the very base letter of the internet that got built out in the early 90s, and obviously prior to that, is going to have to change. And one question I have, what are your, what are your thoughts on, could we, should we ultimately tokenize the way in which um, bandwidth, um, like so people, you, you can, you can build out, there can be a token-driven business model for building out uh, internet service providers effectively. So, so take your model and take it down a level to, to bandwidth itself. Very interesting question. Um, so first of all, I would say that, like, I'll come to the bandwidth after. I'm talking about like the uh, models, like small models working together. Like tokenization already happens to that. Maybe they're not like putting it on the blockchain. Like AI model work with tokens. And their tokens have like different kind of use cases and all that. The tokenization part is already happening. But they're not there in an open ledger so that you can do the accounting. It's not transparent, so you don't know how much token anyone has or how much token some certain model is consuming to generate the inference, right? And that's the problem. And that's a problem we can solve the just token that's there and put it on a public blockchain mm -hmm. so that everyone can verify, mm -hmm. right? And no one can, you know, uh, claim differently, like my model takes less token than yours. Like, show me on the blockchain. And uh, so that's already there. That's already happening. And tokenization works for that really well. And coming to that, like when we talk about bandwidth, um, like, any kind of ISPs providing bandwidth right now, how is that's happening today. But if we want to do it more community driven, if we want to, everyone is providing some bandwidth, everyone is providing some small model to some network, they're providing a contribution to the network. And how do you let them monetize it? Um, they're not going to do it for free. Uh, there has to be some kind of like viable business model for their contribution to be rewarded. And that's where all the tokenization plays comes in. And I'm not, I might sound like a broken record, like, yeah, that's where Web3 solves this, Web3 solves this. But uh, Web3 solves this, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we're in the same camp on that. Uh, but, and, and I think there are, there are a number of things that are good, though, in our view, from this collision of Web3 and AI. So one is that you could argue that you know, people have conceived of Web3 in a sense as uh, um, driving the reimagination of money. And that people have looked at that and said, whoa, well, that looks pretty sort of audacious goal and pretty big market. But actually, I think AI is the bigger use case for Web3. And that's even bigger than reinventing money if one can kind of conceive of a, a thing. And actually, the money bit and the kind of DeFi primitives and everything we need to have baked into our uh, open web stack um, Need, that just needs to work. That just becomes like a, a building block of, of, for everything else that we're going to do. Um, 
Uh, the other thing, I mean, so that's exciting, but the other thing uh, to your point of, about Web3 solving everything that I think is important is that having people from the AI world look at what we're doing should give us a little bit of a cold shower. Like in the sense of like you know a wake up call that you know we're we're already kind of not just drinking the Kool Aid but kind of you know um, something even more aggressive than that and we and we you know we everybody it tends to be a believer within this within the, the space and having folks who in some senses do not care about that but do care about you know problems we can solve for for them and problems we can solve for their customers i think that's really healthy for the for the ecosystem and i and i whilst i'm with you that i think that web3 can solve many things i think we um, particularly around getting the business model to work so that we don't just you know have inflated valuations and then have investors who dump on retail or get people get too excited by points because they think they're going to get tokens or you know, or have kind of small floats and high FTV and all of these things that are buzzing around the kind of, you know, crypto Twitter sphere. Um, we need really sustainable, well thought out economics if we're going to be able to make these different variants of, you know, deep in effectively, um, you know, de decentralized physical infrastructure work um, at every every level. So I'm with your works, but I, I think... Um, we need a kind of beautiful marriage of engineers, economists to make it work properly and at global scale, as you said. Yeah, definitely. Um, that kind of brings, uh, makes me curious about the business models that uh, just mentioned. So do you think um, there's a viable way to get all these Web3 services or Web3-driven services, work, which it can, be, it can be GPUs, it can be data from AI perspective, which are being coordinated by Web3 networks, and there's a viable way to sell that to Web2, who are not really familiar with the you know, blockchain stuff? I think there are, actually. So our, our good friend Anand and, and, um, from Canonical was on a panel with us yesterday talking about a cache uh, featuring on um, uh, a Web2 portal for, um, uh, you know, infrastructure. And I don't actually remember which Web2 portal, but his point was... Uh, when you see just Web2 infrastructure people or AI people sort of buying into the value proposition we can deliver with Web3, then we know we're getting somewhere. And, you know, we are going to have to get over a hump of, of, of adoption that's normally kind of like we're at an optimum and we need to get, a, it gets worse before it then gets better and we can reach a, a new one. Um, but... And so it's not going to be kind of just plain, plain sailing. But And I, I think the opportunity is there, but there's... Um, there is still work to be done to to refine those value propositions. And, and as ever, I think we're a victim in some senses in the Web3 space of the fact that it's the first time, obviously, we've had a kind of financial sort of asset class tied directly to a technology wave, which gives us the prospect of, you know, uh, too many humans succumbing to the to the desire for kind of quick, quick returns. We've really got to sharpen our pencils and work hard on the value propositions, the distinctiveness of the, the, the technology, and how we take it to market and be, you know, narrow and focused, uh, I think, to make sure we get more tra traction going forward. And those who do that and also come up with great token economics and, you know, can go crypto public, will, uh, I think, you know, will we'll do extremely well. Um, yeah, we've come a long way. I once said that to uh, um, John Pfeffer in a debate, uh, basically, as to whether or not Bitcoin was the only token that would ever work or whether there could be other variants. I said, well, it's such a broad design universe, you know, design space, all the characteristics of tokens, the way we can design the models and how it can vary over time, um, the way we can design mechanics, maybe it's a better way of putting it, that, you know, I feel confident it's going to work out. And he told me that was the worst investment thesis he had ever heard. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I wouldn't have said that that we've quite come to the conclusion. I think the jury is still out, but I'm, you know, I remain optimistic we can, you and others can, can deliver on that promise. Yeah, um, that's a great closing thought for us. Um, I couldn't agree more. Like tokens have always worked. It's not a new thing, right? Like money is a token. Like it started as a token for the uh, gold that was stored by the government. And at some point it went away. So it wasn't token of anything anymore. But um, token systems are the best ways. Uh, when I say token, I mean currencies. 
the best, be, best way to incentivize and align a large group of people um, together and make them work and collaborate with each other. And there's no better systems. So, totally agree. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you, everyone.